okay, this is the fifth time we've tried to sing an intro song, and it just keeps crashing when we do. I think it's God <laughs> smiting us. But let's see. Boom, cha, cha, boom, cha, cha, boom, cha, cha, mm, mm. It's the showrunner show. Okay, Andy and Lauren. It's the showrunner show. It's the showrunner show. show. <laughs> Nailed it. That is so bad. Each I feel like you, it's worse really, than the next. You really, you really abandoned me, Lauren. <laughs> I know. Talking about, uh, we're we're going to be talking, uh, talking about teams. Oh, uh, we, we this, this reminds me about when our son, uh, John's and my son, was doing School of Rock and then the pandemic. And it was great, right? They would all get together and play. And they were like really good. And then the pandemic hit and they kept trying to do it remotely so oh my god hearing <laughs> new musicians like this with like a zoom because that's why it was a disaster right because we're you know our timing isn't right oh it was the same thing just like it would have been a disaster for me in person also so <laughs> oh no 100 well, no i uh, could kudos feel for the hit. effort like kudos the... for the effort there <laughs> yeah kudos <laughs> for the effort <laughs> well welcome to the showrunner show where every week we de demystify some aspect to the job of showrunning for anyone who works in tv who wants to work in tv or just wants to know how it's all made uh, this week, we're talking with uh, Lauren McKenzie and Andrew Gettens, who, <laughs> yay, who are two of the best people we've met in the industry in our you know entire time. Like Drew, Drew and I were lucky enough to have two season twos greenlit at the same time, and we were immediately like in panic mode, and we asked everyone like, who can actually do the job of running this show because we we don't have time. And just over and over, we kept hearing uh, Lauren and Andy's names, uh, and we're like, "Whatever it takes, we need to like get these guys." And like, if and you their names are always, their names are always, uh, you know, uh, coupled with you know, Gens and McKenzie are incredible, but you'll never get them, you know. If you, can get them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're lucky. They're so enough, in demand. Know. Yeah. And we're like, we'll do anything. We need, you know, we need them. And, uh, and we met with them and just it, like love them. And they're just good people. They're, you know, they're patient and kind with the people who work with, like, if you ever have the chance to work in a room with them, they're the best. And if you watch, you know, Waco aftermath, like, my favorite scenes and my favorite moments, even in my own episodes, I'm like, oh, that moment's so Andy, you know what I mean? Or that moment's so Lauren. <laughs> like, and it's like my favorite moments, like, you know, in my own episodes are, you know, moments that you guys put in there. There's, there's a moment where, you know, Cogdell's in the bathroom and a guy's cornered him and he's like, you know, get out of my way before I have to throw a punch and embarrass us both. <laughs> like, that's one of my favorite lines of <laughs> the whole series. And, and uh, I I know that's one of the two of you. Like, that's just, you know, um, <laughs> but they're funny. You they're guys kind. were great in all ways. I just want to jump in to say you guys basically channeled Dan Cogdell. I think yeah, <laughs> you true. did some yeah, sort of true. voodoo yeah. where you stole some yeah. of the spirit. Because you know how you have, when you're on a show, different writers just, like, knock it out. They just relate to different characters, and they, they love writing them. Every time you guys write Cogdell, I was like, e -e -e, give me more. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, he was great. I mean, we got to, you know, we talked to him a lot. Like that was part of that process was getting to actually speak with him. And he's such a like warm and also just unique and specific human being, you know, like old school Texas lawyer that he also we're just like, wow, this is fantastic. We got to use some of this. Thank you for that unbelievable introduction. Um, that was so nice of you. We feel the same way about you guys. What an unbelievable experience it was for us um, working with the other most wonderful, nicest people on the on the planet. So um, oh. I'm, I'm just so Thank glad you. it worked out. Yeah, it was yeah, great. Too. And it was just one of those seamless thing like the show just happened, you know, and uh, like you guys just made it so smooth and so easy. So this week, we'd love to talk about how to get yourself into a writer's room. I, I know for myself, like I, you know, went to film school and then I moved to Los Angeles and I basically banged my head against every wall I could find in Los Angeles for like 10 years, just trying to figure out, do I do this? Do I do that? And I just didn't really have people to ask who knew anything. You know what I mean? Like the people I knew were all kind of on the outside of it and didn't have like, and I followed every advice, you know, I, like any stranger, you know, who knew anything, I would do anything. And, um, <laughs> and John and so up on was, Philip you know, Seymour Hoffman in a coffee shop in the village once. You're like, Mr. Hoffman, I did. You, I did. You approached <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman with a script. 
well, he, he was my dream like idea for this role. And I was literally working on the script there in a coffee shop. He sat down next to me. I was like, it's a sign. Like it's, a, I need <laughs> it's to give him this script. <laughs> and it was like one, one of those, you know, just like series of humiliating moments in uh, <laughs> uh, coming. Like he was very nice and very, you know, he's like, Oh, just send it to my agents. You know, he, he was nice about it, but it was, it was like, Oh, <laughs> I look like an idiot. And everyone in the coffee shop just saw me do that and fail. You know, <laughs> and here I am with the script still in my hand. And, you know, it's, it was like one of those shameful, but you know, you try everything. And, uh, and this is, you know, for Drew and I, like a big kind of hole in our knowledge is we tried everything. And then we sort of came into writer's rooms through like a side door. We came from the, you know, movie adapting to television. And so we figured like, we know you guys know mo a lot more about writer's rooms about like, how things should actually be done properly um, than we do. Oh. <laughs> um, and and so, you've helped yeah. a lot of people break in. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're such mentors. Yeah. You've done it yourselves. You each have your own interesting stories of how you got in. But then you've helped a bunch of people. So so you know a whole big bunch. Oh. Yeah, well, we try. We try. Uh, it's funny, you know, you were like, oh, we came in the side door. And I feel like I'm not really sure there's a front door. Like, I feel like it's sort of a wall you have to pull vault over and there's a bunch <laughs> of different ways to do it. There's certainly like a more, I do think there's things you can do to like give yourself a better chance at it. Um, like, just, and was, to, just to interject, Andy and I always talk about it with young writers as like um, winning the lotto and you have to just buy a lot of tickets. Um, mm. And so like he's saying, you have to just keep trying lots of different avenues because hopefully one of them will pay off. Uh, sometimes people will come out and say like, well, I don't want to be an assistant. I'm an artist. I'm just going to make my stuff and it'll eventually get made. And hopefully that's true. But if you're really trying to get into the industry, you have to play all, like, I think you need to play all of the odds, right? You got to, you got to buy that ticket to like everything mm -hmm. um, to be able to get in. And this is, and like all of our advice too is, is like for writing specifically, I would say too, like, you know, and I, I do think for what it's worth, one of the most important things you want to decide before you do anything is what exactly it is you want to do and how much you actually want to do it because it's going to be hard under any 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 version of this you know it's going to take a lot of time and effort and energy usually and commitment to it but from our perspective like obviously what we'll, we'll, what we'll, our advice and our our experiences is, is like the writing track so that's that's what we can speak to but yeah there's i mean just to jump into practicals just because i like practical advice i was the same way as you john just like asking everyone when i was an assistant once i went up to a, a very well-known producer on set who uh, uh was a woman and i hadn't seen a lot of like f female like women in really positions of power and i remember i went up to her as a pa i cannot believe i did this and i was like how do you do this all you have a family right like i was like how, do, how are you like having this position and like it was the most awkward horrible conversation for me as well but i was just like give me your advice tell me all of your tips so i, I get that um need but to jump into practicals like um trying to get uh an assistant job is probably like the fastest way into a writer's room right like you are trying to get anything like you start usually as a writer's pa which is someone that go for people that aren't familiar with it it's just someone that as there is an entry-level position that helps you like uh with very the basics of the office and they usually get lunches and they help get supplies and um sort of basic entry level and then you try to work your way up from there to writer's assistant there's also a position called script coordinator that deals with the scripts but normally you want to try to like get yourself into that writer's assistant position or the showrunner's assistant position those are like the two places that you can really springboard from i look at it like there's basically two parts to getting a job as a writer the first is like being a good writer and having good material and you know there's there's not there's things to be said about how to do that like joining writers groups reading as much as you can writing as much as you can those those things i'm sure other people cover in a lot of so assuming you've done that and you have material you believe in and it's good the other part of it is just access right because with the exception of like the way you guys came in which is a little bit different in terms of you built your career up on sort of the other side of the ledger and then had this idea and you came in you sort of came in at the top but assuming you're not going to come in at the top then the way you're going to get a job is from a writer that's who hires writers full stop is other writers right so 
the biggest part is just access. Like that's what you're looking for is access. And how do you get access to writers? And there's a lot of different ways to do that. But Lauren's right. Like there's concentric circles of access and the closest level is going to be showrunner's assistant or writer's assistant in terms of being able to make that jump. Um, but there are other levels, other concentric circles before that, that'll, that'll get you there too. And like, I agree wholeheartedly with Lauren that there are certainly people that just write something and, and it manages to win a fellowship or get them somewhere and, and they just don't have to take those steps. But to the degree that it is a lottery, like you want to give yourself more chances and working your way up to that job is not just about, it's not just about getting a writer's assistant job so you can get promoted on that show. It's like, you're going to meet a lot of writers over the course of doing that job that are going to be able to help you in a lot of different ways. Because ultimately, like, I feel like for me, when I came here, there's this sort of not fallacy, but you have this idea that you're going to make connections and those connections are instantly going to help you do something. And like the way it really works is you usually make connections close to your own level and then you sort of rise up together, right? Like the connections that you make now, usually it's like in five years are going to bear fruit, not in five mm -hmm. minutes, you know? And so putting yourself in a position where you're meeting lots of people is just giving yourself more opportunity to have connections and access. I love how actionable you guys are being. I too like practical, actionable stuff. Um, I love that you just listed all the, you know, showrunner's assistant, writer's assistant, script coordinator, uh, writer's PA. I think there might've been another one. And it sounds like what you're saying is you sort of get those jobs through word of mouth connections. You just know a writer who's maybe a staff writer or an entry level person. But what if you don't know people? What if you like, are there other sure. ways like a LinkedIn or a WGA website? Do you have to be WGA to access these? Are these delicious little jobs listed somewhere? No, you win. I win. <laughs> win. <laughs> there you go. And I'll give you my example. When I started, I um, I would cold call places. Um, and I don't know if it still works this way, but I, I would bet someone could get in the door the way I did, which was – I would read deadline and it would say um, like what shows were being announced. And, um, and then I would call the studio that that show uh, was being made by. And uh, I would ask to be connected to the production office. And, and usually they do, they would just connect you. And once I got into the production office, I was like, hi, are you hiring um, PAs or writer's assistants? And it used to be like, uh, no, not yet. You usually get a like, not yet, not yet. It's way too early. Um, call back later. And then I would just keep calling back like every couple of days. And then sometimes you would call and they'd be like, oh, no, it's position's been filled. And you're like, but <laughs> when? <laughs> but I did that. I would keep a list, like a like an Excel spreadsheet list of like who, like what places I was calling who I spoke with, when they said to call back, and if I had submitted myself. And then I just did that. And it was like a numbers game. I kept, kept, kept doing it until uh, I would get an interview. And then that's how I got my foot in the door. That is I so think that impressive. Yeah. <laughs> it is so impressive. particularly well with, um, that's really good for network shows that still exist. I think the, the announcements are still a lot more timely with those than they are oftentimes with like streaming shows nowadays. And I was going to say too that Lauren actually, she actually, you actually secured a writer's assistant that job that way, I think, which is wild and very unlikely. But I do think that even beyond that, like writer's PA, like that kind of job is, is that's a way to do it. But to, to your point, Stacey, like almost everybody has some kind of connection, however loose when they come here. Your cousin's uncle works as a gaffer on, you know what I mean? Like, Find whatever you can to try and connect to uh, in the town to just get to get something. Um, and and to Lauren's point, like, you know, these concentric circles, like writer's assistant, showrunner's assistant, those are often referrals, like very, very often those are referrals in some way. So it's pretty hard to get that out of the gate. But PA jobs, like those jobs are a, a lot easier to get, right? And and keeping track of, of what's going in that sense and just trying to get yourself into that world get your foot in the door so you can start meeting other people. The second you get on a set, there's going to be a writer a lot of times on set when they're shooting and you can make that approach at some point, or you can talk to like the script coordinator or whoever is interesting or the script supervisor, whoever's there that you can sort of make a connection to and sort of start the ball rolling for yourself and build up the, the Rolodex. That's great. There may, there may be actually more outreach now than there was back when we were breaking in. I, I know there's been this tremendous movement um, by assistance, um, and especially with guild outreach 
to assistance. Um, and uh, like Liz Alper, I know has, who's a, a board member for writers, um, WGA, uh, West has really done a tremendous job in extending a hand to assistance. And so it might be worth even checking with the guild to see if there is a list, um, that you can get yourself on mm -hmm. for writers mm -hmm. assistance. You could probably just call the guild and ask, right? Yeah. You, you could yeah. probably Google, yeah. you know, Google it or yeah, call and, and ask. Yeah. I'd be curious what your advice would be. Like you're saying, once you're the writer's assistant in a writer's room, you're, you're on the springboard at that point. Your, your, you know, elevation to staff writer is, you know, probably going to happen if you, you know, do a good job and you get along with your showrunners and the other writers in the room, you're kind of right on the edge. Like what advice would you get, give to someone who's, um, a writer's room PA who's, you know, the person getting lunches and getting office supplies and like someone who's not really sitting around the table and having these conversations about breaking the show and, you know, these creative conversations, like that person is around, there is access, but you're a little on the outside of it. And, uh, but a lot of people come up, you know, from a writer's PA to writer's assistant. And I think that's a really, uh, important pathway. And like, uh, for a person that gets that job, what, what would your advice be as far as, you know, how they plant seeds to elevate themselves to the writer's assistant? I would say be brave. I I, yeah. I I think that there's always an element of like, I, I don't think you should try to overstep your bounds. I don't think you should walk up on the first day to the showrunner and say, you want to be a writer and can I have a job? Obviously, I'm not trying to say that. But I do think that the people that we've interacted that we've oftentimes ended up having some sort of mentor relationship or people that are have some ambition to, to mm -hmm. it and put themselves in front of you, you know, and I think there's value in that. And so I would say, make it known that you want to be a writer and, and have material ready if anyone's willing to read you. And, you know, you want to build those relationships in a careful way and an authentic way. You don't want to use people, but I, but don't, don't wait to like, for someone to ask you, you know, don't wait for there to be that spot. Like you want someone to know you want the spot when it opens, you don't want to be asking for mm -hmm. it once it does, you know? It begins with an introduction too. I know, I know you're the ones being interviewed, but I think it's funny and surprising how few people say you're on a set, how few people come up, say, Hey, I hear you're the writer. I hear you that extend their hand, say what their name is and what they're doing that day. Like say, if there are a hundred people playing uh, small parts in the thing, you might have two actors that come up and just say, Hey, I'm so-and-so I'm playing the role of so-and-so I love the scripts. And I just wanted to say hello. And just that. And of course, you don't want to be the leech who's like, so I just want to hang uh, beside you and talk your ear off and annoy you. And, you know, yeah. like, yeah. not that, but just that little bit of an introduction, literally like, uh, I'm surprised how many people I work with that I never or actually meet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would say another thing for a PA too, that I, in our experience too, that I found really um, impressive and helpful and, and, uh, and smart in terms of career advancement is like, the, the, the writer's room PA usually is within earshot of what's happening in the room. And, um, you know, and, uh, I think when you're listening to a season being broken, like whether it's a true story or if it's, you know, pure fiction, there's always like a healthy amount of research that needs to be done. If someone's, you totally. know, trying to invent a character that does a certain job, like we need to know more about that job. And if you're listening and you just take it upon yourself to do some of that research and then present and say, Hey, I've, you know, found this character. That's kind of like the one you're inventing, you know, here's his, you know, personal story or whatever that may be. I think those kind of things I found, um, you know, when people kind of proactively find great details like that and just, you know, slap them on your desk, that's always welcome. It's always, um, you know, kind of an impressive thing because it hasn't been specifically asked of the person. And, uh, I think that's also a way to kind of leave an impression. One thing I love about what you're saying too, is like that, the idea of like, like showrunners and writers, like you notice when the PA is just watching like TikTok videos in their office, all, like, <laughs> and you notice when they're not doing that and when they're like hungry and they're like, Drew and I, you know, coming up or, you know, still we're like, always be selling, always, always be presenting your best face. Don't deliver a draft that's half-assed because you're like, oh, this is, this one doesn't matter. It's only episode four and it's only the first draft. Like, like show up with, you know, like how you do anything is how you're going to do everything. And there's a difference between the the PA who's like, I have hay fever. I can't come in. And the PA who's like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> uh, who's, who's like, yeah, can, can I, can I do some research on possible backgrounds for this character's backstory and present them to you tomorrow just for my own education? You know, like, mm. you know, because as a showrunner, you just have a million problems and you're constantly looking for who's who can I lean on 
uh, because the job is too big and, you know, there's too much to do. Who can I lean on? Who's going to be um, that person? And and even as a PA, you can be that you, you can show that you are capable of being that person. Back when it was physical rooms lately, I've just been in Zoom rooms. So this wouldn't work for a Zoom room. But back when it was physical rooms, I was quite surprised how at the end of the day, people would just clear out like, pew! <laughs> like <laughs> it was like, okay, guys, I think we're wrapping it up and pew, everybody's gone. And I feel like there's, again, you don't want to be a hanger on who's making everyone uncomfortable with your mouth breathing, hang around. But <laughs> on the other end, when the room clears, if you're willing to sort of hang out till the end, I think there are opportunities even if you're lower on the totem pole to go, Hey, I overheard that you guys were talking about this. Um, would you mind if I, uh, uh, try to bring in some research based on that or, or even throw out an idea, even like a little pitch, nothing crazy, but you know, Hey, I read a story in the news that reminded me of blah, blah. like, that's sort of your chance to connect, to pitch, to show that you're hungry. You know what I mean? Like yeah. everybody leaves. And if you care and you show up and, and they care, a couple of people stay who really care, often the showrunner. And if you show that you care and are willing to stay a, a few extra minutes, like, I don't know. Do you guys agree or are you like, yeah. oh my God, no, everybody's going to stay? No, 100%. 100%. I, I, I would say too. I mean, that's how I got my start with, like I started uh, working for David Kelly and I was a um, PA and his shows are very research based. I mean, I was working on Boston Legal and it's just like, a, you know, lot, uh, like a case after case of, uh, every week. And that's exactly how I got my start, Drew. I was going to say the same thing, which is that um, I just did some research for them. I typed it up. I didn't even like, it wasn't even a big presentation I gave. I just had done it and then gave it over to the writer. And and then they liked that research. And then they moved me over into a more writer's assistant position. And then I was able to kind of rise from there. I will also add too, as an PA or at any kind of entry level, you don't have to focus only your attention on the showrunner. I think yeah, you need to sure. start and look to see who kind of sees themselves as a mentor, as writers. Mm -hmm. um, we, Andy and I owe our career to other writers in writer's rooms who just uh, were approachable <laughs> and, yeah. and helpful. And at some point they offered to read our material and we gave it to one and then another was like, Oh, I want to read it. And, and it sort of spread through them. And then collectively they sort of boosted our career. Um, you know, cause a showrunner often has like a ton of responsibilities and they can't also be launching your career at the same time. And so sometimes you can kind of work with the other writers and get to know them and that can launch you. And oftentimes you're going to have a lot more in common with the lower level writers and assistant, right? You're gonna be closer in age, closer in experience. Like it can be easier to build that connection in a more authentic way. But I was going to say, you guys brought up so many great points. Um, you know, in terms of like what you're trying to do in any situation where you have access to other writers is like showcase your like your ambition, your professionalism and kind of like your uh, abilities and any way you can do that. Like, uh, you know, if you're going to get the lunches, get them perfectly. If you're going to like all of that, I think is it matters because ultimately, like when you think about hiring somebody eventually on a staff, what you want is, you know, someone that's going to be like, uh, in that's going to put the, their whole their whole self into it, and if they're not putting their whole self into something else, it's hard to make that jump in your mind that they're going to do it for for your project. Um, I also just wanted to say off something you guys said, like a little story that comes from our first experience writing a script, uh, and how that also I think is relevant. Which is the first thing we ever wrote that got on the screen was a freelance episode of a show called Elementary, which was on CBS for many years. It was like Johnny Lee Miller, Lucy Liu. And uh, the way in which that happened is Lauren was the writer's assistant for that show. And the showrunner is a guy named Rob Doherty, who's a wonderful guy. And Lauren was very at this. She had had several writer's assistants, I think, smartly had learned the lesson of like sitting, you know, waiting for anything is not a good idea and was very forthright with him in terms of like, what I want is to be a writer on this show. And how do, how do I get there? And, you know, basically kept at him. And he was like, well, you know, you guys could always pitch ideas if you want to pitch ideas to me. And so Lauren and I would literally send him three ideas every week. We're like, here's more ideas. Here's more ideas. Here's more ideas. Here's more ideas. And, and eventually I think he was like, fuck fine. You guys can write an episode, you know? Uh, and, and so that, that was effective, but it speaks to something too, which is like showrunners in particular, but, but many writers too, they don't have a lot of time. And 
So you need to put yourself in front of them. Like I tell this to to people breaking in, even before you get to be an assistant, when you move to LA and you're trying to make connections, like I'm like, pester me, like, don't feel like you email me once and then we don't set up that lunch and then that's it. I'm like, you got to stay on people because it's not coming from a place of malevolence or annoyance or anything like that. It's, it's purely the fact that like, we're all super busy and I'm sure you guys too, like there's a lot of people out there who are trying to break in that are oftentimes trying to take your time. So the people that like are able to stay at it and actually like arrange it are the ones that actually get themselves in front of you. So I just, I'm a big proponent of, um, of putting yourself out there. Yeah. I'll I'll add I'll add too on that story is that um, the way we did it too, because we it's not like I got in front of his face and was pitching him every week because I think I would probably be fired for that. But um, <laughs> I, he had written up, we would write, write up like a one page sheet and then I would just slip it into his inbox like every Friday, like every Friday, every Friday, every Friday. And then, yes, I think at some point he was like, fine, like, <laughs> fine. I'm going to feel like an asshole. <laughs> shot. So, yeah. Well, that. That kind of stick to itiveness, like, you know, that's that's someone who's gonna be around in twenty years. You know what I mean? You're like, yeah. oh, this is the, these are real, these are people who are willing to face rejection over and over and keep showing up. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Because that's the job. Sure. Like that's the sure. job. Like, yeah. and and I gotta say two things like one thing I love too is the idea of saying, what can we do to position ourselves to be like You know, like, I feel like often people kind of skip that step and like, will you make me a writer? And it it kind of puts the onus on the person to try and figure out how to do that as opposed to like, what could I do to position myself? And, and the idea, you know, you guys had a script ready to go so that when that, like, I know in my own experience, I've been like, Hey, I'll read something if you have something and, but they don't have a script they're willing to share, ready to share, like to have that thing. Yeah. ready to drop even if it's not perfect even if it's your best foot forward but it's polished to a point that you think it's you know ready to be seen to have that ready to go like those things i i think are really invaluable yeah i would agree i really think it's important like andy and i were talking about this that first script that you sh- um have and show to people we encourage people to take chances for it to be daring for it to be like we had a a showrunner friend of ours say when he was like reading to staff his show and he was reading a bunch of um people's original material if it was something that he felt like a thousand other people had sort of done this story as a very trod story but well told he was like that's not as interesting to me he said because you can write about anything in the world this is your material this is what you want to put out there this is what you want to say and like I'm interested to know what you want to say. And if you're just saying something that's been like, kind of like recycled a million times, like, I don't know if I need that voice in my room. So especially in these beginning stages, like take a swing at something and, and like, you know, make an impact, have something to, to, to write about and have something to say. Yeah. Just to piggyback on that, like, this is sort of, you know, like, like Lauren said, we're very much into the nuts and bolts and sort of the like utilitarian side of how to do this. Um, Every person that comes here, event, you need to establish your own narrative <clears throat> when you get in a room, when you're meeting with somebody, when you're like, ultimately, when you think about hiring somebody for anything, but certainly as it gets towards closer to being a writer, like you, you want to know what they're going to offer, obviously. And and I, I want to just preface this by saying, I understand, we all understand as writers, like our, in our minds, we're like, we can write a lot of different things, right? And we want to write a lot of different types of things. And that I understand that. So this isn't coming from a place of me not understanding that. But I also think that we have made the mistake earlier in our career of trying to hit every base when we think about what we can write and what we are as writers. And that just ends up being nothing to the person that's listening in a lot of ways. Uh, So you want to think about when you craft your sample and also who you are, you want those things to have like a synergy. You want to write a sample that is weird and different, but that also speaks to something about your own experience and who you are. Big proponent of that. And I, I, I will say again, as a caveat, I think a little of this is bullshit. Right. I think that the people sitting on the other side of the table that are executives that are reps a lot of the time, like buy into this idea of authenticity that I don't always subscribe to because I, I think that we are people that have imaginations and are, and part of the beauty of writing is be able to mm-hmm. jump around into different perspectives. However, I do think that there is a hundred percent, especially now, there's this huge onus on authenticity on your story. And so leaning into that, I think is smart when you think about how you want to craft your sample and how you want to talk about yourself a little bit, right? When somebody's asking about you, whether it's 
at, at the lunch truck, if you get on a set, or if you're in a meeting, general meeting with a rep or executive, like you want to think about talking about yourself in the context of who you are as a writer and something that's going to make you stand out and interesting. What is the thing about you that makes people want to hear something from you, you know? And I think your sample ideally should also reflect that. That's yeah, a really get vulnerable. Sorry. But... Yeah. yeah. I was gonna say, that's a really important point. And it, like both of you guys are making in, in the idea of like, I can't tell you how many times John and I have had conversations about hiring somebody and said, Oh my God, you never believe how, you know, where this person grew up and the circumstances and like, yeah. you know, and like mm. all of these things that you can gather from a sample, from a writing sample that kind of alludes to interesting life experiences that are, um, I think so important. I think, you know, that the, the, like you said, Lauren, that the script, the sample doesn't need to be so polished. And so like shoot ready, it needs to like, I don't know, elicit more, interesting life experiences, taking swings, you know, like we hire people, I think everyone hires people into the room for big ideas and, and, you know, that creative energy versus it being like a perfectly polished, you know, finished product. And I think that's, uh, um, really interesting. And, and to circle back to your point about, you know, the mentorship, I think this is such a mentorship business and, uh, the, the entertain, inter entertainment industry writ large is very mentorship based. And I think, uh, you know, one thing John and I realized in the feature side of things early is like, let's find those mentors meant, you know, and how do you find a mentor? You might ask yourself, like, where do I look for one or who wants to mentor me? And I think one thing we realized is, oh, people want to mentor, you know, younger yeah. talent. Like, I think it's a human, you know, condition to want to mentor people. And I think, you know, to use that and to, to know that when you reach out to somebody that they may not respond to your first email and you mentioned it, you really have to stick to it. I know for me, you know, if someone's reaching out to me, that's, uh, you know, wanting a, you know, entry level kind of job and I don't respond to the first one and then they email me back. I never, ever, ever think of that as pestering. I a hundred percent of the time think yeah. oh, I'm such an asshole. I forgot to respond to this email, you know, totally, <laughs> last totally. time it's always, you know, I, I internalize that as my fault. Like I, I'm yeah. such a, such a jerk. But they, um, they, they think they're pestering you sometimes, totally. you know? Totally. Yeah. You should put that. And I'm that kind of person who is like very like cautious of pestering anyone or, you know, if they didn't respond to me, they must think, you know, I suck, you know, and that's never the case. That's, it's <laughs> always that people are busy and they just, uh, they just didn't get to it and, and to, you know, continue to put yourself out there. Drew, I'd like to piggyback on that if you don't mind, because I do want to say, I would say that advice is fantastic for 99% of the listeners. There is that 1%, I'm sure you guys have all experienced people who, this is the classic thing, will call you stoned. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. there was somebody I was doing Walla. I was an actor and I was doing Walla with somebody and they were like, oh, your husband's a writer. I, you know, I want to be a writer. I'm going to call and pick his brain. So this fella called me and John, you weren't available. You were gone. But he and I just started yakety yak. We talked for like half an hour. It was all over the place. And he was like, at the end, he was like, well, it's probably good that your husband couldn't talk. I was like, fuck, it's so stoned right now. I wouldn't remember <laughs> any of it. I would put that in, <laughs> you know, in the what not to do. Now, like I said, for 99% of listeners, this will seem obvious, but there is that 1% that's like, oh. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. I should not call stoned. Or yeah. if you're, <laughs> or some people will, um, they'll turn in material that's not ready. Or uh, here's a good example of how I, in my life, how to do it. So we hired a babysitter who was also a writer, a very talented young writer named Mark Brockwell. He's currently working as a showrunner's assistant. He just casually mentioned to me while he was still our babysitter, a project he was working on. I said, that sounds really cool. I'd love to read it. He waited a full like six months, nine months, and then emailed and said, hey, remember that conversation we had? Well, it's all polished to perfection and ready to go. And when I read it, it really was. It was polished and tight and it had momentum. It's like he was proactive enough to pitch it. He was proactive enough to remember that I'd offered to read it, but he was also disciplined enough to wait the six months or whatever until it was in good shape. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I think that's, I think there's a fine line. Yes, you should be proactive, put yourself in front of people, um, ask for mentorship, introduce yourself, do all those things, but you also should be disciplined about it and respectful of the other person's time. It, that's a really good point, yeah. Stacey. Like we tell people to, most people will read something of yours once. You get yes. usually one shot. So you want to make sure before you send that script that that is what you want to lead with. And that, that one yeah. shot, by the way, it's going to be five pages yeah. long. You know yeah. what I mean? The one shot will be, totally. if it's a good yeah. five pages, they're going to read the whole thing. That's what I do. But if, yeah. it's allowed, if you can't make your first five pages good, then dear God, what? You yeah. Know? 
Yeah. I was going to well, say the same thing. Know, yeah. Make that first five pages really uh, stand out because it, it's un an unfortunate reality when you're, you know, have a hundred scripts in front of you to read samples for people to potentially hire. A lot of those scripts you can read five to 10 pages and, and move on. And, uh, uh, but the ones that you're engaged in those first five, then you'll plow through. And, uh, and, uh, but that, that's the intro is really, really important. The last time we staffed a show last year, you know, we probably read a hundred and something scripts at least. And Oof. the thing that I came away with from it was a couple of things. Like one, it's like the most of them are pretty good. Like there's a ton of B pluses out there, a ton. And now I'm talking about working writers, by the way, right at this point, like the scripts are good, you know, now there are very few that are fantastic. Like there's very, very few that are A's. And so when you think about writing and breaking through the clutter you know, and actually getting someone to want to mentor you and champion you, you're 100% right that that needs to be great. And I think it speaks to also another sort of tangential point, which is when you start writing, like you need to find a community of people who are going to read your writing and help you make your writing better. There's also a community you need to build on that. I mean, there's the David Kellys out there who are like in law school and write a script and everyone's like, oh, you're a genius, get out here. But mostly people need time to get better at the craft. And, and so I think another thing that we find, I'm sure you guys have found too, is like someone just moved out here at a college, they're 23 years old and they have a script. It's the first script they've ever written and they hand it to you. And it's terrible because not because they're bad writers necessarily, but because they deserve their script, you know? And so people that can read and help you make stuff better along the way also, I think is a huge part because, you know, it's going to take time for you to put yourself in the position to give it to somebody that's going to really be able to help you and use that time to make yourself a better writer. Well, I would say too, just as a, like one thing I I'm always wary of when someone's like, will you read my script? Often what they want is me to read their script and be like, this is brilliant. I'm sending it right. to Brad Pitt and CAA. You know what I mean? Like I have a financier yeah. who would be perfect for like, that's really, you know what they want. And short yeah. of that, like they get, angry and i'm like oh people aren't asking me for notes most of the time where as a writer like that's when i give a another writer a script i'm like hey will you give me notes so i can make this better because that's always you know that's the end goal is to craft it into something that sparkles and i feel like it's impossible to you know we all have blind spots we all have things we don't see or you know things that you know, we're trying to communicate that aren't getting across like everyone. And, and I think people become better writers as they have better people around them, giving them better notes. And I, you know, I would say like, you know, if a writer said like, Hey, will you read my script and give me notes so I can make this really good? I hear like professional writer in that, you know what I mean? I'm much more willing to do that versus like read a script that I know if I have any notes is just going to make the person angry at me, which, you know, like. I've, I've kind of essentially stopped. I've been like, okay, I, I don't read scripts anymore. Cause it's just, everyone's angry at me and I'm like spending all this time. And it's just, it's when horrible. John takes meetings with yeah. people, that's his, his rule is no homework. So he'll, you know, it's like, it's his mom's dentist's brother's cousin who's <laughs> moving to LA and wants to be writers. Like, yes, I will have coffee with you. No homework. You can't, you know, yeah, you give can't me give me it. homework. <laughs> and, and and there's exceptions. Like I gotta say, there was there's a, exceptions. A guy, there there was a guy, a uh, 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 British film student reached out to me on Facebook. Was like, oh, I'll yeah. be in, L I'm, I'm coming to LA. I would really, I'm trying to meet filmmakers. I love your work. Like, could I just buy you lunch? And and I was like, wow, that's really gutsy. And why not? And I showed up. And the guy spent the whole lunch talking about how he's uh, talked to all these filmmakers into having lunches and so he can get selfies to, you know, show off to his uh, film school friends. I was like, shit, why'd I do this? <laughs> like, this is such a waste of time. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, okay. No, You're like, I'll have the lunch there, please. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. there's things like, like there was an opportunity there that I feel like he could have uh, just – Instead of talking, like asking, like, I know for me, you know, I wanted to be a professional writer. I was banging my head against the wall. Uh, Stacy's brother, Steve Shabosky is a, you know, professional writer. And one night I was like, I've tried everything I can think of. Like, I don't know what else to do. Like, how did you do it? Just talk me through how you did this. And he had this like, oh, nobody's ever asked me that. Thank you. And he's like, 
first I listened to like all Tony Robbins, you know, tapes. And then I like, and he talked me through this process that I went through and, and it worked, you know what I mean? It, I mean, it, yeah. Like it, it helped me get out of my own, you know, comfort zone and challenge myself to, I don't know, try things that scared me and, and give people scripts and be vulnerable and talk about, you know, myself and, you know what I mean? Not in a, like, I'm going to be a great filmmaker, but more like, I'm scared and I'm trying to do this thing. Like, can you help me? Um, yeah. Which I feel like goes a lot further. Before, Andy, you went into a thing about, you know, what makes you specific and authentic. And I think most people understood what you meant. But I just want to jump on that of saying it, it's the things that make you a little weird or a little different or a little vulnerable. Yeah. That's what you're talking about. The good stuff. Not just like I was raised in Boston and I sure do love baseball. No, no, no. But like, no, yeah, it's yeah. not that everyone, you, you would think I, I could see a young I mean, writer. That's pretty close to me, but yeah. <laughs> I that's could see a young pulse, writer. <laughs> Soon, too soon. You were describing me a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> but I could see, I could see someone listening to this. If they were young, if they were insecure, if they had imposter syndrome, and they're like, everybody went to Harvard and I didn't. You know, being like, say you have a parent that's in prison. Say you grew up in a trailer park. Say you have some sort of really interesting, weird way you grew up, or there's just something about. It. Or the opposite. You maybe you spent the first. 18 years of your life uh, studying to be a professional gymnast and you didn't live with your family. Like it's all of that stuff, right? I think that's what you're talking about. Now I could see somebody who has imposter syndrome and is young and insecure, keeping those things to themselves. Like, Ooh, nobody needs to know that, you know, that all I really know, I can't actually spell. I can only uh, figure skate, but uh, those things are actually helpful, right? And if you can infuse that into your script and it just makes you interesting. Anyway, I just want to circle back to that. I know we've moved yeah, on. 100%. But. No, I was going to say too off what, uh, what what John had said too that I thought was really interesting. It's like I 100% agree with everything you said. I would bet like if if you if I was coming to LA as your dentist's sister's whatever and I was like, have coffee with me and we had coffee and it was great. And then nine to 12 months later, I was like, hey, I got a new job and I'm doing this new thing and I was wondering if I could just pick your brain about something. And then 12 months after that, you're like, hey, you know, um, I'm actually in between jobs right now. I was wondering if we could go hike and catch up, right? And then if they're like, hey, will you read something? You'd be like, yeah, I will, right? Like, it's I, it's like, you got to play the long game. You got to aggressively play the long game. That's what I would say. That's so smart. <laughs> like, the long game like, on many different levels. As many people you're playing the long game with, the better. Yeah. And that, that's such smart advice. And it isn't like, you know, John, you were saying that, that is something we run into so often of like, I've got the script where you read it and you realize quickly that, yeah, the only interest is if you can flip a switch and make this script, um, you know, put it in production overnight, then, you know, I'm interested in continuing this conversation. If not, you know, um, then I'm, you know, it's almost like they're wasting their time with you. And that, that, that obviously right. is not a good strategy, but what you're saying. And like, how many times I'm sure it's the same for you guys. Like most of the, when it, like, let's say a connection pays off, what it usually is, is they reach out three years later and they're like, Oh, this project just came up. That seems like it would be good for you guys. Or yeah. this you know what I mean? Like, it's never like, what do you have for me now? Yeah. It's it's yeah. never that. It's always like later, you know? It's funny. I'm just making a note to call someone, uh, the son of someone I used to work with in New York 20 years ago <laughs> is a film student. And we talked a couple times, you know, and he's, yeah. you know, an undergrad and he's just, we talk every six months and he's going to graduate in another year or so, but he's definitely playing the long game. And I just made a note to like, Hey, give that kid a call, <laughs> uh, see what he's up to. And yeah. like, you know, I'm already like prepped for him to kind of enter the business in uh, another year whenever he graduates, uh, because he's, played it so i mean he's doing all these things asking for advice and is it feature or tv that i should be looking at and all the things that you know is fun for us to talk about and uh um and not just you know dumping you know a thousand pages of material in my inbox to read you know it's kind of um but yeah but i'm actually motivated myself to reach out to him and, and catch up versus the other way around yeah yeah there's no quick path yeah. there's no quick path yeah. like and i i i like you know what you're saying like that yeah, playing the line, like Drew and I, that's been our mantra since early days. Like, you know, let's play the long, we're playing the long game. We're not, we're not going for the like really bad horror movie that we're going to be embarrassed of two years from now. We're, we're, you know, we can slow roll this. Like we don't have to like worry about, don't worry about today. Like plan for like 10 years from now. Where, where do you want, like, and God, it took Drew and I, I think 12 years to start making a living doing this. Like we were hustling 
for a long time, and it was a v- much longer long game than I would have, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. chosen. <laughs> Extra long. Yeah. Well, yeah, you were hoping, you were hoping, you were hoping for a par three. Yeah, that'd be our biopic. Par three. The longest, yeah. the longest, <laughs> the longest game would be our, our biopic. Good game. Time. We talked a lot about, like, oh, it, the, the sort of holy grail is to make these connections and work your way in concentric circles and trying to find a job inside of a writer's room. Awesome. There are other avenues, and I just wanted to to just tag those really quickly in terms of other things you should and could be doing at the same time. One is there are many fellowships and uh, other competitions as well that that can be – like we, we've been in so many writers' rooms, and I think the room we're in right now, two of the five or six writers came out of fellowships. Like it's a very, very common path. Uh, I won't go through the entire comprehensive list, but a lot of the studios, uh, Warner Brothers or Disney, or HBO, they have these fellowships where you apply with a script. And if you get in, there's like a year's worth of training. And then they oftentimes try to place you inside of a writer's room with your first job. And those are incredibly valuable, very competitive, incredibly challenging to get, but also like a very worthwhile avenue for putting your material forward. And if, if your listeners want to know what those are, if you go to WGA Foundation, and you just uh, look up fellowship programs for screenwriters, it has a full list for you. To, that, is um, such, that is so awesome. awesome. That's such excellent advice. That's really great. And uh, I want to bring up one more thing before we get into rapid fire too. I just, uh, I feel like there's one question I certainly get a ton is, is the agent manager question for, you know, uh, upcoming writers. Like, how do I get an agent? How do I get a manager? And I think there's some belief that that thing is going to, you know, if I could just get a manager, it's going to change everything. And, uh, I'm not sure that's always true. It's certainly helpful, no question. But, um, you know, I do know there's kind of that paradox, whether you're, you know, it's true for actors, it's true for pretty much everyone. Like, uh, it's very hard to get an agent or a manager when you're kind of up and coming. And then you have some some amount of success. And then suddenly all the agents and managers come to you at the same time. And that's a, it's an unfortunate paradox because it's not um, the most helpful path. But I'd be curious, you know, um, what you guys think is a, an appropriate answer when someone says, like, how do I go about finding a manager or agent or representation in general? I agree. It's not really a silver bullet, It's uh, which is a disappointing piece of information to learn, I think. Um, I'll split it up a little. I'll say I'll start with agents. You know, it's important to understand that something that took us a long time to understand, which is the dynamic of the relationship. It's easy. It's easy to look at it from your own side and be like, I need this agent because they're going to help me get this. The way agents view things, for the most part, for the most part, there are definitely exceptions to this where a young agent finds a sample they love and they're like, I'm going to champion you and I'm going to find a way to make this happen for you and for us. Mostly, they want to, they, they look at you as an ATM and a little, a, right, to a certain degree, right? They're like, do you have something that is going to be sellable, staffable, whatever, right? And, and with the least amount of effort possible, because agents have 150 clients, most of them, right? They have a shitload of people that they're servicing. And so... Um, particularly in LA and this climate now with the consolidation of a lot of the big agencies in particular, you know, more than likely what's going to happen is you are going to get work and then an agent's going to be like, Hey man, what's going on? Not, I don't have a job. Find me a job agent managers, slightly different. There's a huge plethora of options in that regard. Our experience. I mean, I've personally had three different agencies and two or three different management companies over the course of my career. Before I really broke, most of those were ineffective. I, there's a lot of managers that don't do anything and very few that do. Uh, if you can find one that does 100%. But again, I would never hang my career or my future on the idea of finding representation. That's not to say it can't be something you're doing along the way, but it is by no means the answer to how you're going to break in, usually, yeah. Yeah. With, with a few exceptions. That's great. It's, it's a like, lottery ticket that's not a great one. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I think going back to earlier in the conversation, other writers are, are to me, the most valuable relationships you could make as an up-and-coming writer are other yes. writers. We have hired 100% of our writer's assistants in rooms have been the recommendation of another writer in the room. And 100% of those writer's right. assistants have then become staff writers in our room. So, I mean, I think... In our experience, that is that is by far the most valuable direction. That's another good tip for assistants is like, 
you want to work on the show, you want to work for like you guys, right? Like if someone says, oh, why is this uh, writer's assistant position empty? Oh, it's because I promoted this person to writer. You're like, that's the job I want. Right. There's a lot yeah. of people that don't oh. promote and you want to try to like wiggle your way in to a place that does promote. And if you find your pl- yourself working for someone and you're like, oh, this is never going to work out, then you got to kind of look around and see if you can <laughs> jump to another another show, another um, showrunner. Yeah. Yeah. I had, I had a thought when you guys were talking about fellowships, I had a thought of like, here's, here's another idea that, you know, if you're, you know, you know, trying to make it in television and want to get into a writer's room, take your favorite show and look at like IMDb, look at the list of writers who worked on that show, find them on social media, reach out to each writer and ask if you could have coffee with them. You'll come to them. You'll make it super easy and just ask them how they, you know, made it onto the show and gush about their episode, tell them how much, you you know what I mean? Like, I I feel like there's, and just do that every day, you know, like there's social media that, that wasn't around really when I was coming up because, you know, those 12 years were in like the dark ages, you know, before, (laughs) like when Drew and I, Drew and I sold our first movie. And we literally went out and bought iPhones, which had just come out, and underwear because we ours were so <laughs> full of holes, and we were so poor for so long. Um, <laughs> all right, well, let's jump into the rapid fire four. Rapid fire Woo! four. So this week uh, we'll ask Lauren the rapid fire four, and next week Andy. No, we're recording it all the same week. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, four questions we ask every guest. Number one: What is the first television show you truly loved, and why? Um, Seinfeld, even though I'm a a drama writer, Seinfeld was truly the first show that I loved. It was a show that my family watched all together and we would normally have, um, uh, dinner at the dinner table. But when Seinfeld was on, we got to eat in front of the TV and that was glorious. (laughs) That's so sweet. That's beautiful. (laughs) Stacey, you want to ask a second? Oh, I do. What is your favorite part of the job? Uh, my favorite part of the job is getting to work with other artists and, um, both in with other writers. I think it's so fun. You're just getting to play make believe with other writers, but also when you get into production and you get to work with artists in all different fields, uh, I find that so exciting to see what they bring to the table and, um, and sort of getting to, uh, support each other's work is really uh, an exciting place to be. So I'll ask the third one. What is the part of the job that costs you something? Uh, the uncertainty where your next job is coming from means that a lot of times you can't plan for a vacation. Um, and actually, Andy and I have still never taken a honeymoon because um, when we got married, we had just staffed on our first show. And we asked, we got married over Labor Day weekend and we had a Monday off and we asked if we could take the rest of the week off, like the four days, just to get away for a little mini moon. Um, And we're told, uh, you know, by a writer who's a friend now, so he's going to hate to hear this story. (laughs) Say his name, say his name. uh, (laughs) (laughs) But but he said, listen, you could, you can take a honeymoon, but you're going to get really like resented for it. It's not going to go well for you. So we didn't. We went right back to work. Um, I think things are changing in this regard. Like I think people are getting to have more personal lives. But when we started, you just like you bled for your shows. Um, and I think that that part was hard. Not getting to have a honeymoon with my uh, with my husband. Oh. oh. And number four. <laughs> we'll uh, get there if someday. You, <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you had a time machine, what one piece of advice would you give yourself when you started your television journey? I would say to be braver and to um, make more of my own material that's what i would do beautiful that is beautiful. i love this yeah well thank you guys for a wonderful episode we'll be back next week with working as a duo or not and the ups and downs of uh being a writing duo <laughs> i can't wait to hear cool. that theme song it's gonna be incredible <laughs>